a dialect that totally unlocks the secrets of ancient Greek pronunciation, especially that of classical Attic, is Boeotian. Boeotia is a region that's located next to Attica. That's where Athens is. One of its famous ancient cities is Thebes. And the Boeotian dialect is amazing because it seems to show really innovative features back in classical times that look like modern Greek. Now, does this mean that the modern Greek pronunciation already existed way back in antiquity? Or does the evidence from the Boeotian dialect make our standard model of classical Attic pronunciation that much stronger? Well, let's find out together. I'm Luke, and this is Polymathy. So Boeotia is here, and it looks like an absolutely beautiful part of Greece, but what else is new in that wonderful country? Boeotian dialect was a part of the greater Aeolic dialect, which I told you about in the Ancient Greek Dialects video. Boeotian had a lot in common with other Aeolic dialects, like lesbian, but also shared features with the Northwest Greek dialects that it came into contact with. Later, we'll see a full text inscription of pure Boeotian. It's going to be amazing. Some of the sources I reference for this video include, of course, Vox Kraika by Sidney Allen. And we also have Sturdivant's book, The Pronunciation of Greek and Latin. These are both really important and foundational. Then, of course, there's the wonderful Greek, A History of the Language and Its Speakers by Horrocks. And, well, these, these are tremendous, and I already did a review of them on the secondary channel, Polymathy Plus. This is the short guide to the pronunciation of New Testament Greek and the pronunciation of New Testament Greek by Ben Cantor. These are amazing. You want to pick these up. Go check out the review on Plymouth Plus after you see this video, of course. And I almost forgot to tell you about a new favorite Buck's introduction to the Greek dialects. Links in the description. So the really, really cool part about Boeotian is how it spells its own words. At the end of the 5th century BC, in the year 403 Prochristu, Euclid, the Archon of Athens, adopts the Ionic alphabet for all Athenians as the standard writing system of Attic. And the prestige of Attic takes the standardized Attic Ionic orthography across all of Greece. So other dialects learn the sound values of the various Attic Ionic letters as are used in Attic and use them to write their inscriptions from that point forward which is really fantastic and helpful because we get to see how other dialects were pronounced differently from Attic. Αν θέλετε να μάθετε περισσότερα, αυτό το βιβλίο, βιβλίο, Vox Graeca, Vox Graeca στα αγγλικά, στα ελληνικά, η προβαρά της ελληνικής, την κλασική εποχή, είναι πολύ χρήσιμο. That said, let's take a few common words in Attic and Boeotian and compare them with one another. Attic for and is gai, but in Boeotian it's ge. Theban in Attic is Tebaios. In Boeotian it's Tebaios. Has in Attic is Eki. In Boeotian it's Eki. Ah, looks like a very interesting vowel shift is going on. This is how Boeotians were spelling their words in the middle of the 4th century BC. Since the Attic Ionic orthography had spread everywhere, they used the Attic Ionic values of the letters to spell their dialect as it was pronounced. Let's see how this maps out with the International Phonetic Alphabet. This is the IPA vowel chart trapezoid. The front axis and the back axis is the front of the mouth, back of the mouth. So just see my video about IPA vowels to learn about this in detail. Now here is where the 4th century BC Attic Ionic letters fit onto the trapezoid. Iota goes up here. It's a close front vowel, E. Epsilon Iota is the close mid front vowel, E. Eta is the open mid front vowel, a. Alpha iota is the diphthong i, going from a to e in one syllable. That's a diphthong. So we see something really remarkable. Alpha iota doesn't appear in Boeotian because the historical i diphthong that 4th century BC Attic retains has become a in Boeotian. Historical long open mid a, retained in Attic as a, raises to e. And the historical long close mid vowel e has closed to e in Boeotian. What's so amazing is that 
These are the exact same kinds of changes that happen to the vowel system in Attic later on after it becomes Common Greek or Koine. Physica, stane elinica, legete kini, alasta anglica, ine koine. Yati, epidi starche elinica, legete koine. And we took the ancient Greek word with the ancient Greek pronunciation, koine, and we turned that into the English word koine. It's not from modern Greek, and that's why it doesn't sound like the modern Greek word kini. Okay, just wanted to go over that. In any case, these changes are amazing because it makes it seem as if the modern Greek pronunciation already was blooming in antiquity. Well, not really. So Attic goes on to become Great Attic and then eventually Koine. And we know that the general pronunciation of the diphthong Alpha Iota was indeed I. It was still a diphthong because in Latin it's transcribed with the equivalent diphthong, I. And we also have commentary from numerous grammarians, Greek ones, Roman ones, explaining the diphthongal nature of it. The monophthongal pronunciation, that e, the thing that happened in Boeotian independently of Koine, that occurred more generally in the population after the 2nd century AD. So it's really interesting that Boeotian anticipates these changes, but they're not necessarily genetically linked at all. In fact, their evidence would seem to say that it's just parallel developments. Something that does take hold, though, in Koine, especially by the classical Roman times, is the pronunciation of epsilon iota as e. That shift takes place and is complete while we still have the diphthongal pronunciation of alpha iota. And that's the general pronunciation in Hellenistic Greek all the way through the beginning of the Roman period. We have numerous pieces of confirming evidence from the actual ancient Greek misspellings as well as the Roman transcriptions of Greek words. Just see my Epsilon Iota video after this one, of course, to learn more about that. So while Koine I does later become E and Eta does close to E in later Koine, this development is separated by what was completed in Boeotian by centuries. Could it be that Boeotian speakers had an effect on later Koine? It's entirely possible, but it's not necessary to explain these parallel developments. These kinds of developments, very similar things, happen in languages all the time. We don't need a linguistic genetic explanation, genetic in the sense of where it comes from. We're going to see more on why Boeotian is most definitely neither the root of Koine nor modern Greek shortly. But before we learn about that, I want to tell you how you can learn everything you need to know to understand all the ancient Greek dialects, including and especially Attic and Koine, since these are the foundations of ancient Greek, and that is with this video sponsor, the Ancient Language Institute. The Ancient Language Institute uses a flipped classroom model. Thanks to numerous audio and video resources, some of which made by you truly, uh, you can actually be totally prepared for every lesson before you actually meet your instructors, before your very first class, and that way you have what you need to know to feel confident in every lesson so that you maximize your learning experience every time. And these instructors, colleagues of mine, are some of the best. Imagine learning ancient Greek from people who speak ancient Greek fluently, comfortably, and are so glad to guide you from the basics of the language to the most beautiful and fascinating literature. After the first year, you're going to be able to read the pre-Socratic philosophers. You're going to be able to read Euthyphro by Plato. I love Plato. I'm super into Plato at the moment. And you're going to be able to read, of course, the Koine Bible. You're going to be able to absorb all these things after just one year of the outstanding instruction at Ancient Language Institute. Now, the registration for the spring semester, that closes on the 16th of December, so don't delay. You definitely want to sign up while you have a chance. And arranging the times for the classes, it's really flexible. You'll be able to work with the staff and the instructors in order to get the best class time. So don't worry about that, that's, that's easy. And not just Ancient Greek, but Ancient Language Institute also has, of course, Latin and Old English, as well as Biblical Hebrew. You can take classes from the beginner level, intermediate level, advanced level, depending on where you are, and there is a variety of other courses that I know you will absolutely love. So go to ancientlanguage.com and sign up. Learning ancient languages opens just so many doors. Hey, look, we're understanding Boeotian together. That wouldn't happen without being able to learn ancient languages. So learn an ancient language with Ancient Language Institute. So what about the other vowels? Well, here is where the Attic vowels fall onto the trapezoid. The pre-classical hypsilon was certainly ou, 
But before the 5th century BC, it was already fronting towards U. Omicron Hupsavan goes here in mid 4th century BC Attic. U, having closed from a close mid U as it was during 5th century BC Attic. This change from U to U and U to U is paralleled in French and even Scottish English and other languages. U is a close back vowel. Omega in the 5th century BC was an open mid vowel, O, but since more room has been made for it on the back axis, it could be floating anywhere in here. So it could be an open mid, O, or more likely a true mid, O, by the mid 4th century BC. The diphthong oi spans from here to here. This is the adjective for Pythian in Attic, butios, and in the genitive case, it's butiu. Now, the Boeotian spelling of butiu is amazing, butio. Since Attic had undergone a shift where historical u fronted to u, the letter used for it in classical Attic, the hypsilon, well, that wasn't appropriate for the Boeotian sound where historical close back u remained u. Thus, they use the standard Attic Ionic orthography for u, which is omicron hypsilon, u. The genitive ending in Proto-Greek was oyo, and the y fell out in most dialects, leaving o o. O. It's a long o vowel, o. Now, while this o raises to u by the mid 4th century BC in Attic, the historical long o vowel stays o in Boeotian. Isn't that wild? And this is why Boeotian cannot be evidence for the modern Greek pronunciation already existing back in antiquity. Just cherry-picking parts of it but not looking at the whole system doesn't count. Some people like Karagounis. I addressed his whole infamous article on the secondary channel, Plymouth Plus. I could actually go through every single one of his fallacies and errors and explain them in detail. So go see that video after this. You'll enjoy it, I promise. Folks like Karagounis and others disingenuously cite only some things they find in things like Boeotian and point to that and say, aha, back in classical times, there was this pronunciation that was innovative and therefore that was also the pronunciation of classical Attic. It's, of course, nonsense to insist that all the Greek dialects were pronounced in the same way. And it's, of course, even more nonsensical to believe that they all had the same modern Greek pronunciation way back in the 5th century BC. And they really do this. They point to certain spelling confusions that might not even be part of Attic and say, aha, that's the historical pronunciation of ancient Greek, that the modern Greek pronunciation of Greek is the historical pronunciation of ancient Greek. Historical. By the way, if you ever hear someone use the term historical pronunciation in the context of ancient Greek, probably this is just a dog whistle for they're trying to insist that modern Greek pronunciation is the same pronunciation of the Greek language for more than 2,500 years. It's a truly extraordinary fallacy, and I'm amazed <laughs> at the things that have been written about it. I already addressed Karagounis' article. Uh, this one, it'll be next on Plymouth Plus. And the reason this is so easily disproven is that while we do have these interesting changes on the front axis in Boeotian, where e goes to e, e goes to e, and the i monophthongized into e in mid-4th century BC Boeotian, the back axis is doing something quite different. The u didn't become u like it did in Attic. It stays u. So it can't go to u to even become e, which is the modern Greek pronunciation of y. That doesn't happen. So if that doesn't happen, then it can't possibly be the same phonology. It can't be the same phonological system, the same vowel system. If the modern Greek vowel system really were derived from the Boeotian system, or if the Boeotian system were trying to tell us, oh, this is the sound system of all ancient Greek in this time period, which it, of course it wasn't, but if it were, then you'd have to say to upothetiko in modern Greek instead of the correct tu hypothetiku. Another bit of evidence that folks like Zachariou and Garagounis cite in order to justify their historical pronunciation is that the original spelling of the alpha iota diphthong was actually alpha epsilon, and that this alpha epsilon spelling was changed to alpha iota in order to conform with 
other diphthongs orthographically, like alpha iota. So just an orthographic convention that the alpha epsilon is the true revealing thing about the pronunciation, and that this original spelling, in fact, must be e. Why must it be e? Because, well, in ai, oi, and so forth, then these diphthongs, the accent's written on the second member. Now, in the case of, say, omicron iota, oi, they say that it must be e because the accent marks over the iota. And, of course, no, that's not why it's there. The short diphthongs, like in classical Attic, I and Oi, they have the accent mark over the second member because putting an accent mark over the first member is reserved for either long diphthongs or more commonly for two vowels that are not in a diphthong. That's a simple graphic way to represent that. And if we actually look at how accent marks are used in antiquity, they're normally written over both vowels to show that, hey, this is the pitch accent that is associated with this whole syllabic unit called a diphthong, the joining of two vowels in one syllable. The fact that the later convention that is now part of the standard spelling of ancient Greek puts the accent mark over the final vowel is irrelevant. But let's keep talking about this alpha epsilon. So the alpha epsilon spelling, the original spelling of the alpha iota diphthong, must therefore have been pronounced e. That is the conclusion that Zachario and Karagounis come to. Therefore, the e pronunciation of alpha iota, the monogreek pronunciation, was already the only pronunciation in antiquity. Here, I'll read what Zachario actually says. It's on page 39. Alpha iota was originally written alpha epsilon, pronounced e, just like Latin ae, pronounced e. And he has it written, the a and e written together, the e way, which is a very common spelling, especially for ecclesiastical pronunciation. But by conformity to the spelling of the other proper diphthongs, its second letter epsilon was changed to iota, hence the alpha epsilon being spelled as alpha iota, equaling the pronunciation of e. He then goes on to use some kind of pseudo-linguistic notion to justify why that would occur. Now, in addition to not understanding how classical Latin pronunciation works, in the case of Zachariu, these folks did not do their homework. Alpha Epsilon is not the original spelling of Alpha Iota. The diphthong Alpha Iota, its original spelling is Alpha Iota. So what's this Alpha Epsilon they talk about? That is an innovative spelling found in Boeotian. This is such a fundamental mistake. Karaguni says on page 8, Originally, the diphthong alpha iota was written alpha epsilon. This was changed to alpha iota by analogy with epsilon iota, omicron iota, upsilon iota. However, because of its original composition as alpha epsilon, it did not acquire the sound of e of iota, as did the other diphthongs, but retained its original sound of e original sound. So the original sound is e, all the way back in deep antiquity. It's very interesting that neither of these gentlemen cite their sources. In fact, when I read those things, I'm like, where have I read this thing before I saw in, in the one book? And I thought, oh, I thought this guy, but wait a minute, where'd they get them from? Eventually, with a little searching, I found, oh, this is just a Boeotian thing. Amazing. That aside, the fact that Boeotian does use the spelling of alpha epsilon it uses this before the 4th century BC, by the way, is absolutely amazing because it tells us some really interesting things about the changing phonology of the Boeotian dialect. And where we find these spellings of Alpha Epsilon is principally at Tanagra. Darmok and Jalad at Tanagra. I remember the words, but I don't understand. I'll help you out, Captain Picard. At Tanagra, we find old epigraphy prior to the 4th century BC, like Aiskondas and Okibai. In both places, the Alpha Epsilon stands for historical Alpha Iota. So what's going on here? This is where Sacherio's noting of a similarity with Latin is actually germane. But he assumes that classical Latin, A-E, is pronounced E, as in ecclesiastical Latin, which is wrong. That's not how classical Latin is, so we can't give him too many points. Standard Latin A-E, as in Aides, used to be spelled A-I, Aides. 
So why the change in spelling? Because the diphthong began to open from ai to ai. Eventually, this would change into e for most spoken Latin after the 2nd century AD. Given that 4th century BC Boeotian spells gai, the Attic word for and, as ge, we can infer that Boeotian prior to the 4th century, when there were made inscriptions like okibai, pronounced this as gai, a slightly more open version of the diphthong as an Attic gai, but not quite where it will end up later as ge. Also at Tanagra, Darmok and Gillard at Tanagra. We see Omicron Epsilon for Omicron Iota. Koiriros, Huekadamoi. Digamma, which looks like an F, was retained in Boeotian for a while, and also, look, the sound of the H, the letter H, is still used here, and the combination of the wa and the ha, well, it makes hua, just like what which used to be the standard pronunciation of that digraph in English until really just a short time ago, which is why I still use it. Anyway, this is just as classical Latin, oi, shows the opening of the former oi diphthong that we see in Old Latin. The diphthongal pronunciation of oi that was becoming oi, well, that seems to have hung on through the 4th century BC. But in the 3rd century BC, we see the Attic hypsilan letter used for it instead, rugia which is oikia in Attic. Boyotus, or boyotus. This could be actually an u instead of an u, and they just use the closest Attic letter that's the equivalent to it. Here, the diphthongal pronunciation may have persisted before vowels, which is why we still see the Omicron iota in boyotus. But then a later inscription, buotus, is found. And after that, we see another interesting phenomenon. Instead of the Attic equivalent, autois, we see autis. So this could be that the u monophthong simply unrounded. The unrounded version of u is e on the vowel chart, giving us autis. Or if the u had in fact closed to u, then the unrounding of u is e, autis. Now what's so fascinating about that? Well, that's exactly the kind of development that happens much, much later, though, in the common Greek and in medieval Greek. Let me explain. So, Omicron Iota does become U in Koine Greek at a later stage and is the universal pronunciation by the end of Koine and is also the universal pronunciation through most of the Middle Ages, at least to the 11th century AD, and is even retained in the what's called Athenaean dialect, the modern Greek dialect of Athens until as late as the 19th or 20th centuries, which is amazing. So that U sound keeps on going, and that is the fundamental pronunciation. So if Boeotian is unrounding it, either to A or to E, this demonstrates definitively, once again, that the phonological system of Boeotian is not that which gives us Koine, Medieval Greek, or modern Greek. It shows interesting parallel developments, very similar and sometimes not quite the same. It cannot be the origin of the common Greek features that we see. Could Boeotian have affected Koine Greek, though? Now, while it's possible that Boeotian speakers had some influence on Hellenistic Greek, the analysis of non-standard epigraphy in Attica done by Theodorson shows us that Attic was quite capable of changing all on its own. Interestingly, like Boeotian, the vulgar Attic subsystem is not that which was the basis of Koine either, which we know because it too, like Boeotian, has certain innovations that did not occur in Koine or even modern Greek, namely that Epsilon, E, became E. That doesn't even happen in modern Greek. See my video on vulgar Attic and Theodorson on Plymouth Plus. Oh, also this video on Scorpio Martianus. So Boeotian is extremely useful. It gives us a clear representation of the sound of Attic thanks to the useful comparisons. Having clear confirmation, for example, that Alpha Iota is a diphthong in at least Hellenistic Koine, and therefore also in classical Attic, well, this is a super useful data point. Boeotian also helps us to determine the timing of certain sound changes in Attic and also helps us resolve a controversy between those two greats, Sturdivant and Allen, because Sturdivant and Allen disagree slightly on the vowel system of classical Attic. Allen arranges the vowels like this, and Sturdivant arranges them like this.
Allen says that it's unnecessary to reconstruct epsilon and omicron as short, close mid vowels and opines instead that they are probably more open in quality, which coincides with how they are used in Koine and later on and makes sense with some Latin comparisons. Sturtevant proposes that epsilon and omicron are indeed close mid vowels, firstly because the long vowels that arise from their lengthening, epsilon plus epsilon e, e becomes e, and o o becomes o, and since we know that e and u are close mid, then it makes sense if e and o are close too. Allen says not necessarily because long vowels can heighten, they can raise, and that's a pretty normal thing. Nevertheless, Sturtevant notes also how Plato names the letter epsilon, epsilon's a medieval term for the letter, but that's not what it's called in antiquity, the ancient Greek name for the letter, which Plato uses in 399 BC in his Cratylus dialogue, is E, shortly after the Attic Ionic alphabet was instituted. Indeed, the original names for epsilon and omicron are E and O, and they get those names around this time, late 5th century or early 4th century BC. Therefore, Sturtevant concludes that the classical Attic pronunciation of epsilon and omicron is e and u, at least into the first half of the 4th century BC. We also might just split the difference and call them true mid e o. Boeotian notably starts the use of omicron hypsilon for u after 350 BC, precisely 346 BC for the putio inscription, where Attic's word is Sturtevant uses this to give us a really precise timing for the change of omicron hypsilon from u to u, since in Plato's time, when the orthography was standardized, it was u. Well, when did it become u? Right about here, right about here at the mid 4th century BC, giving us u in putio. Alan doesn't agree with Sturtevant for two reasons. One is that, well, if it's U by the mid-4th century BC, then it's probably U already for at least a decade. And since that's still the classical period, it wouldn't really be appropriate for us to assign different pronunciations for different authors within the classical period. So I'll just make it U for all of classical Attic. The other reason that Alan favors U as the classical pronunciation is because there is evidence to actually show, thanks to spelling errors and other things, that U was already the pronunciation in the 5th century BC. The problem here is that Alan does not distinguish between the conservative and innovative subsystems of phonology within Attic. This is something that Theodor's son does extremely well. You really need to see the video on Polymathy Plus if you're interested in this, because I show you all the details, and it's amazing. Basically, you have an innovative subsystem, which is already doing all sorts of fascinating vowel changes, and already closes O into U. The conservative subsystem, which is the basis for the orthography, and that orthography and conservative pronunciation is the basis for how all these other dialects, like Boeotian, are starting to spell their own words in the 4th century, while there's definitely some cross-pollination between the vulgar Attic and the classical Attic, it's the classical Attic system, the conservative subsystem, that's the one in question here. So that's why I find Sturtevant's argument to be more compelling. Naturally, though, once Hypsilon's value began to front, it went from U to U to U, well, space was opened up on the high back axis for Omicron Hypsilon to raise towards U. Thus, the classical Attic value of this digraph was probably neither O nor U, but something in between. U, this little T symbol underneath the O, is actually an up arrow, and it's pointing up to say that it's not merely O, but U. It's a closer U sound, but not quite U. Something like this can be heard in Scottish speech. Now let's hear what Boeotian may have sounded like in the mid-4th century BC, from this inscription found in ancient Thebes, Doi krimata sune balonto en ton polimon to nepolemion boi o toi, peri to hiaro to embel pois, pot tos asebiontas to hiaron to apollonos to putio, aristionos arcontas, aluseoi, and so forth. In English, this means the following contributed money to the war fought by the Boeotians for the temple at Delphi against those committing sacrilege against the temple of Pythian Apollo in the archonship of Aristion, the people of Alizia, etc. 
Now I've translated this into Attic so we can see what some of the really interesting differences are. Hoi di cremata, sunebalonto, eston polemon, honepolemun, boyotoi, peritu hieru, duendel pois pros tu sasebeontas to hieron, tu apollonos tu butiu, aristionos arcontas, aliusaioi. Here we see a lot of the fun features that we already talked about. In aliusaioi, Attic, we have aliuseoi, so the i becomes e. We also see that the e has become e in krimata. Attic putiu is, of course, putio. We've already talked about that extensively. Really interesting, we see that del pois is bel pois. So this is a different realization of the original Proto-Greek sound as it comes into biotion. And we also see in the third word, sune balonto, we see an aspirated t. This is probably from analogy with the meta ending of the we form. Also super cool to see how the etymological long o, like in tos or to, remains o and doesn't go to u, like in attic. Also notice that attic imperfect, which is epolemun, it's epolemion in biotion. And how come? Well, the attic imperfect, this is the contracted form, which is the only normal way to do it in attic, but it comes from epolemeon. And the eon is turned into ion. Epolemion. We also see that in another word. What is an attic? Asebeontas. It's asebiontas. So thanks for taking this little journey with me through the actual historical pronunciation of ancient Greek, how we can see fascinating differences in Boeotian that are innovative, but some are actually more conservative with respect to Attic. Depends which axis, right? Front axis is going towards the Iodicization, but the back axis isn't. So thank you so much for watching. Thanks again to the Ancient Language Institute. Go to ancientlanguage.com to check them out. And thanks to each and every one of my Patreon supporters. Charidas polas humin echo. Hugiainete. 